What a mess. Greetings. <clears throat> Happy Mother's Day to you mothers who are sitting here. Some cases it's Happy Mother's Day and Happy Grandmother's Day, and so it goes. But we extend that to all of you who are with us, even uh, on these uh, internet connections this morning. You who are with us live, may the Lord richly bless you. It's good to be here with you today, and. Uh, uh, let me remind you, since this is a, uh, uh, an, since these sessions go out throughout the body of Christ and virtually around the world, let me remind you that the sessions that you are now seeing are brought to you through the facilities of the Midwest Center for Truth here in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, they are a ministry of the Bible Research Center, which is a ministry of CMI Fellowship. Uh, and many folks are connected with that. So we operate here as a voice for a larger number of believers who are seeing Christ. And um, these sessions are uh, a production of CMI Audio Video Network System. They're being brought to you now through Ustream and through YouTube. Uh, so we just welcome all of you, <clears throat> no matter where we might be finding in you or where you are while you're finding us today, we welcome you to these sessions. Um, we're glad to see Richard Mixon uh, with us today. He's been through a time I tried to call twice and only got his answering machine. It's the age of machinery, which I hate. <laughs> oh, it's true. Believe it or not, I would be content if we were all riding horses. <laughs> yeah, well, no, give that some thought. <laughs> give that some thought. And <clears throat> it's good to see Richard and, and, uh, and Judy, of course. Um, remember, uh, Brother and Sister Monk, um, whose son uh, died uh, um, over a week ago now, and uh, 
it's the same way there. And I, I communicated with Brother Monk through, through a, a, a card that Janie and I sent to him and that I filled up the inside of it. <clears throat> I'm glad that I did because I had some idea that I may not be able to get a hold of him all that easily. Uh, to my knowledge, he has no uh, cell phone, and so you, you call the house. Uh, and, that was, and that was right. I, I called once a day, every day, uh, after, after, the, after I knew the funeral was over. And, and of course, our brother uh, 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 Jim Moore is out there, and I talked with Jim on Monday on our Skype class. Uh, and, uh, but <clears throat> I, I honestly didn't know, and many of you may not, that, that know uh, Brother Monk and have met him there in Tazewell. Uh, he invited me to come to Tazewell in 1995, Janie and I, and we've been going ever since. Uh, the uh, the uh, brother and sister Monk are still there. And, uh, 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 brother and sister Carr, Peggy and Larry Carr, are the uh, pastors there at this point in time. Sister Carr functions uh, as a minister in CMI, and uh, and she's the one that called me and told me about the death of uh, of their son. I I had no idea they had a son. And I've known the man for 20 some odd years and I didn't know he had a son. But the son didn't live there and, and, and all of that. And so, you know, it was, that's how it, all of that happened that I really didn't know about that. But he was a married, married son and had children. Uh, and uh, was in his late 40s, if, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, but you know, it, it makes no difference what age your child may be, uh, male or female, they're still your child. And so I, I understood what had happened to them and uh, communicated with them by the, the card that we sent. And uh, and I probably wrote more on that card than I write on anything because that's, you know, I communicate face to face or I just about don't communicate at all. Uh, and so, uh, in, but I've been trying to get a hold of them now and, and uh, I keep getting the answering machine. So I finally left a, a message on the answering machine, but I just did that yesterday. Oh, it was last night, in fact. And uh, because when you talk to one of those machines, as all of you know, it's just like talking to yourself. And I was thinking about that afterward. I'll, I'll, I'll see Brother Monk and both of them, Sister Monk, and I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll have, I'll have time with them. But uh, you, you know, you don't really know why you're not, you're not reaching them. You just get an answering machine. Uh, and all of you have done that by trying to just call different places of business or hospitals or doctors or, you know, whatever. And sometimes you get calls on your phone and it's an answering machine more or less calling you. Uh, and... Uh, it's different, though, because I make a lot of recordings. I'm making one right now, and I'm seeing you, but we're not seeing the vast majority of those that are, that are with us uh, this morning. Uh, we check the numbers uh, on our Internet systems and so forth, and there is a rather large number uh, that... Uh, who are with us uh, in many of our times, and particularly on the Sunday morning time. Uh, there are some who are with us on a regular basis. And uh, so, but I do make recordings, and I, the one I was thinking about was the uh, monthly CD. 
I've done that for 35 years, I guess, or longer. Not on CDs, started out on, I don't know what kind of tapes, but it finally went to uh, cassette tapes, and then from cassette tapes to what we have now in the CDs. What I was going to say is, though, that has always been for me like a direct communication. Uh, I have the liberty within myself uh, that when I make those, it's not as though I'm actually having a recording, but though that I'm sitting in someone's living room, someone's office. Uh, and it always has been that way, and I don't really know why, except, you know, maybe it's just uh, uh, the way the Lord has dealt with me on those monthly CDs. Uh, there is no lesson, no teaching, period, that I do now or have ever done that I enjoy as much or that I, or that I feel the direct connection with than those who, with whom I communicate on those monthly CDs. Uh, they're not on the internet. As far as I am concerned, they never will be. Uh, they are sent by request, and they are, uh, they cease to be sent by request. Uh, but I visualize those, and, and, and it's like the people that, you know, that I know, uh, that I have seen and still do see throughout this fellowship. So that's different <clears throat> than it is uh, on uh, other, uh, you know, uh, trying to leave a message uh, with, a, uh, with a machine. And I, I appreciate uh, the fact that folks can call me and leave a message. Uh, at least I can hear who is trying to get a hold of me and call them back. But uh, remember that family in prayer, uh, brother and sister Mount. And uh, I can't tell you all of the conditions that are there other than that they are uh, a, a precious couple. Brother Monk and I have had precious fellowship for all of those years. Like I say, he, he invited me there, Janie and I there, uh, uh, in 1995, however long ago that's been, it's been a while. And we continue to go, and uh, so uh, they're having their services today uh, there, and uh, uh, just in your thoughts and in your heart, just reach out and uh, minister to them. And we appreciate that. So. I was thinking of, 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 of them along with, along with, with, with Richard now, uh, and uh, this morning, and uh, so it's good to be here, and uh, in, this, in this very vein of thought, I want to continue this morning, in this very vein of thought, you'll see what I'm saying in a moment. I want to continue this morning with Christ, the end of all things, and Christ, the end of God's view concerning all things, and He's certainly the end of God's view concerning man. Now, we've been talking about that, and we have been looking at that as uh, from from uh, the uh, from the reference of uh, let me see the reference of uh, Ephesians, um, I believe it's Ephesians. Uh, let me see. No, oh, no, no. Well, it's First Corinthians two, isn't it? First Corinthians two. Verse 7, the hidden wisdom of God. The hidden wisdom of God. 
Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is in 1 Corinthians, well, it's 1 Corinthians 1 and 1 Corinthians 2, but the verse I'm reading you is 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. And we've been looking at, at that statement with regard to God's view of man uh, and in fact God's view of everything and have been emphasizing that Christ himself and we've been looking at the scriptures that show that and in fact last Sunday we stopped with uh, Romans 8 28 through 29 uh, actually and uh, we, may, we may continue at a later date on that, but uh, we will be dealing with uh, a verse this morning in uh, Philippians, the, uh, I believe it's the second chapter, it may be, let me see, uh, it's Philippians, hmm, Yeah, Philippians, Philippians, well, I was sitting up here last night, or late last afternoon, and I wrote that down, and I certainly thought I wrote it down here. Anyway, it's Philippians 3, verse 21. Philippians 3, verse 21 is what we're going to be looking at. Oh, never mind. Never mind, I wrote that on part of my outline for the next monthly, C <laughs> next monthly CD, uh, which is talking about uh, the excellency of the greatness of his power. And like in most cases, many of these searches that I do and studies and sharings that I do all come together. Uh, and the one declaring Christ as being the end of God's view concerning all things, and the one with regard to that you may know, Paul saying in Ephesians 1, that you may know who is, because in, in Ephesians 1, verse 18 and 19, where the word what is, that you may know what is uh, the hope of his calling, what is the expectation of his calling, and then it goes on, and what is uh, his inheritance in the saints, the, the richness of his inheritance in the saints, and then what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. The word there should be translated as who, uh, and, and has the translation uh, as uh, who. And it makes sense that way more than it does what. Who is the expectation of his calling? Well, it's Christ. And who is that richness and so forth of his inheritance in the saints? It's Christ who dwells in you. And it's the same thing, who is the greatness, the exceeding, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward. That word to usward, the better translation is in us. In us, that which is in us. The exceeding greatness of his power in us who are believing. And we're looking at that on the, uh, actually on the monthly CDs, but we've come to that in this very, in this same, very, very same lesson with regard to Christ being himself, that standard, that end, that completeness of all things in God's view. And we have gathered that together. He is the completeness 
of our salvation. But, hon, our salvation is a very great salvation. It involves the whole eternal plan of God. And we, in and of ourselves, are not the thing that our salvation focuses upon. It is our salvation, all right, it is a gift of God. But who is the salvation? And more than that, or as much as that, who is the gift of God? It is Christ himself. And we, we know that. We've been looking at that for a long time. But just to gather it all up, the very thing, the very thing of God, God's whole plan and purpose is focused in His Son. And we related that in these sessions on Sunday mornings, we related that to creation itself. So that we find that when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to our union with Christ, that we're not dealing with just a creation, we're dealing with the new creation of God in Christ, which is, which is eminently greater, which is exceedingly greater than the creation here that you can see with your, that, you know, with your eyes, the, cre the natural creation, uh, which, um, which is subject to death and subject to destruction. But that new creation in Christ is not. And we dealt with that. So, so the new creation, the end of that, God's view of a new creation finds its completement, finds its standard, finds its substance in Christ. And then in dealing with that creation, we move to man, God's view of man. The end of God's view of man is not man in and of himself, but it is Christ who is made unto us. And remember that. You'll have to remember that because we, we were in 1 Corinthians uh, and uh, uh, with, with, with regard to Paul's statements, uh, you see your calling brethren. You see your calling brethren. I wish that Every believer did, in fact, see their calling. Paul there brings us to a statement giving us to understand, if we have any, any ears to hear at all, that our calling is With regard to you and I, Paul says, who are of God in Christ. You have to understand that the calling of which Christ is the great expectation, that the calling wherewith we are called of God is in Christ. That that calling is translated as vocation. It becomes the vocation of our soul and that the hope of that calling, that is the great expectation of that calling, is fulfilled in the appearing in you of the one who is made unto you everything of our salvation. So Paul says, I, you, you see your calling, brethren, and what he says right after that, this is in 1 Corinthians 1 chapter, you know this, Right after that is, it's not in you. It's not in your greatness. It's not in your weakness. It's not in you. And we dealt with this. because You have to bring all of that to the cross. But who of God are in Christ who is made unto you? Wisdom. That is exceedingly abundantly above. Because look what he does to the wisdom of man in that chapter 1. Look what he says about it. So what I'm telling you is what I've been trying to say in these sessions is that the exceeding, the hidden wisdom of God is not simply God hiding some thoughts from man. 
the mystery of God which is hidden that Paul talks about, even the hidden wisdom of God is not just some thoughts in God's mind, it is Christ himself who is the ultimate, the epitome, and the very spirit and substance of the thought of God's mind. The thought of God's mind is not like thoughts in our mind. The thought of God's mind has substance. The eternal, eternal Word of God that was in the beginning with God, was God, same in the beginning with God, is not a figment of God's spiritual imagination. It's not a figment of God's thought, not a figment at all. No, that eternal Word is spirit and truth. That eternal Word is one with God, that eternal word that has that substance by which we may come to know God is Christ himself. And hun, it is Christ himself who dwells in you by his eternal spirit. And while this book, the scripture given of God, all are a testimony of him, he alone is the eternal Word of God. And it is in Him that every scripture comes to the end, completement of its testimony. Whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, Christ Himself is the end of the testimony of the scripture. If you will search the scripture by the Spirit of God, the end of that search will inevitably be Christ. But you see, most people don't do that. They search the scripture with man in view. Even when they're looking at salvation, man is in view. When they're looking at a new creation, man is in view. Not Christ, not Christ, the man, the son, the substance. No, we look at ourselves. And in looking at that union which we have with Christ as his body, I thought about it last night. And again this morning, in fact, I I got up thinking about it. And so I, I thought, well, then we may as well look at it as it actually is in God's view. And so on this little diagram behind, I simply drew that circle. And I put there the man which surely we've come to realize is Christ out of our search on what is man two or three weeks ago. The man whose body we are. It is It is it is God's will and intention, His plan, His purpose that we've been talking about. <clears throat> that our view of the body of Christ is not men, women, Jews, Greeks, knowing no man after the flesh, and right after that, knowing no man after the flesh, right after that, the next sentence after that, in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, you know this. The next sentence, because... The word there is for in your King James Version, for, because. 
if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, old things are passed away, whatever that means to you. And we're not going into the theology of that this morning. It isn't important right now. Old things are passed away as to that creation. Not found in that creation. Behold, the King James says, uh, I haven't quoted it in that way. I've almost forgot how it quotes it. Behold, all things have become new or are made new, something like that. Well, see, that's, that is not actually the proper translation. The proper translation is, Behold, the new is come. Well, now, see, that changes the whole thing. It changes it from old things, T-H-I-N-G-S, Two, the new has come. Not things, not new things. Behold, all things are made new. That's how it, the King James states it. That is not, that's it's a bad translation. Behold, the new is come. Well, yes. In another place, it is said of Christ, Christ speaking, in fact, I make all things new. Well, yes. Now, if you can hear this, <clears throat> the new creation is not something other than the body of Christ. And the new creation is not something other than one new man. And that new man is Christ. And how do we relate to the new creation? If any man be in Christ, in union with Christ, how, do we, how are we in union with Christ? We're in union with Christ because through our new birth, that birth which any man be to be born again, you know the word again there, it's, 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 it's even here in the King James at least, here in the middle trans, in, in, you know, in the, in the, what do they call it, the center reference. Born from above. And then Jesus goes on to say, born of the Spirit. We know it to be the Spirit of Christ. So how are we in Christ? Because Christ is in you. Now he says that to his disciples in John 14. He says that in that day. What day? The day that I will come again and dwell in you by my Spirit. He is talking about that very thing in John 14. I will come unto you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you without a father is what that actually means. I will not leave you as an orphan or as orphans as those who have no fathers, I will not leave you as, well, I can't go there, those who have no father, those who are fatherless. I will come. All that in John 14. And then he says, even of that, a few, that, that my Father and I will make our abode in you. And there he says, you shall know in that day. Well, yes, he's speaking there specifically about what happened on the day of Pentecost, which canceled out the day of Pentecost as a as a Jewish festival, and canceled it out, actually, as a feast of the Lord, as far as it had, having in and of itself any further validity, the validity of it had come in the person of Christ, the fullness of Pentecost had come in the indwelling Christ. 
And so Pentecost now is a person fulfilled in the person who dwells in you. In that day, in that day, you will know I am in my Father. I have completed, I have finished the work. You are in me. I in you. There's the whole, there's the whole key to it all. In John 17, he says the very same thing. Really, he does, and I can show it to you verse by verse. He says the same thing, and he ends it the same way. And I in them. We're talking about The man whose body we are. And I have to, I have to, I have to go into an area that I always, I, I always hesitate into which I always hesitate to go. Because if you hear what I'm going to say and I'm saying, with a natural ear, try to conceive of it with a natural mind, then you're, you're, you're going to end up in one of two ways, at least one of two ways. One saying, I don't understand any of that, and, and I, I just don't know what he's talking about. The other way, well, you know, your natural little natural light bulb will come on, and you'll say, oh, my, we're the Christ. We are the new man. And we are not. What I'm trying to tell you is that the Spirit of God would bring us from the view of many to the view of one and maintain in our soul in an abundant way that Christ is that one, not me, not you. And yet... The grace of God, the gift of God, the exceeding greatness of His power, that hidden wisdom that only God can reveal, and as we have found out, even in our last lesson, is not laid open for the carnal mind. that the natural mind simply cannot know. Unfortunately, the natural mind does get a hold of it and goes into ludicrous realms of imagination. We are. I am. What a blasphemy to the view of God. What a blasphemy to the work of the cross. What a blasphemy to the one who is living in you. By, and not by, as the very gift of God's grace Himself. And so I'm very reluctant to go there because the natural mind goes there and changes the words us, we, to he, and him. Now Paul 
changes the pronouns to he and him and his in reference to us. He lives in you. You are his body. Those kind of things. Joined together as one body with him who is the man living in that body, every piece of it, all of it, in all of it, the substance of all of it. Once you see that relationship with him in his face, hon, it will devastate it will devastate you as to the natural man it'll devastate you as to the Jew and the Greek the Gentile the male, the female of that species, the young, the old of it, the bond, the free of it. It'll devastate you there and release you to a creation that only God can reveal in the face and person of His Son. Paul says, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now that's a creation that the, where the natural mind can't go. The problem that comes up is that we have this treasure, at least for a moment in time, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. But Paul wrote that as saying, we have this, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power. Now, hon, that's the same excellency of the power that he is talking about in Ephesians chapter, let me see, yes, chapter 1. I believe I'm right on this, Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe? And I told you a while ago, the exceeding greatness of His power. Who is the exceeding greatness of His power in us? And now he's talking about that same power which worketh in us. He's talking about that same power in Ephesians 3. In Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Now that's it. In, in the first few sentences of this letter, what we call chapter 1, he's praying that the saints will come to know him in this way. That you will come to know who, who is the hope of His calling? And who the riches 
of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See that? And then, and this is just his letter, is it not? He begins to, he begins to expound upon that. Still saying that it's his prayer. That he's praying. But look where he goes with it. And to know the love of God which passeth knowledge. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And he carries this thought right on. Now to him who is able to do this. To do exceedingly abundantly. See? Everything that God is doing in you, hon, is exceedingly abundantly. Anything you can walk out these doors and see. It's exceedingly abundantly anything you can go to some mountain where there is an observatory and look into space and see. Exceedingly abundantly above the natural creation is the new creation. Why? Because the exceeding greatness of it is Christ Himself who is the creator of all things. But you see, your creation, you're being brought into being through Him living in you is a workmanship that is in Him, in Christ. Before the planet you can see and the creation you can see was created, God chose that to be in Christ. And by the exceeding greatness of His power, He has brought you and I, who were dead, has brought you and I to be a new creation. Not an old one made better, not an old one resurrected, but a new creation by a new and living birth from above. By the Spirit, a new creation, because the man of that creation lives in us, and our union is with him. And he is made unto that creation, be it male, female, boy, girl, whatever. He is made unto that creation the wisdom of God. The power of God. Righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And these are not things that He does for you. These are that which He is in you. No wonder it is the movement of the very Spirit of God in every believer to reveal that Son. Why? Paul tells us again and again and again that ye may know. That you may know. On our next monthly CD, I want to look at the word that ye may know. I wrote it down yesterday or day before and stuck it in the notes there with that. That ye may know. True spiritual acquisition, laying hold of, making it your own. True spiritual experience is nothing less than, and can't be anything more, but it's nothing less than having comprehension of who Christ already is in you. 
the power of that knowing, since it is given of God himself by the revealing of the one who is known. The power of that transforms our soul. And nothing else will. Everything else is just head knowledge about salvation and my Lord and my God. Even in Christianity, there's more versions of that than you could ever count. And none of it works. Well, time is almost gone already. I want to direct you to two places. One of them is, is in Corinthians. And the other is in Philippians. Uh, and along with that, there's other things to say. So, you know, I, uh, first, first Corinthians, let me see. I'm going the wrong direction. First Corinthians 12. What a mess people do to this chapter. What a, what, what a mess. What? Because they go there once again with themselves in view. Now, salvation is about them being this, them being that, them being, that's salvation. And being this kind of a preacher, that kind of a preacher, or this kind of a believer, or that kind of believer, it just, oh, Lord. Well, I'm not, even, I'm not even going there to that part. For as the body is one. Now the answer to verse 1 through verse 11 starts right here. The word for means because. Because. All of this is because. For, the, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For well, by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body. What a baptism that is. Romans 6. Romans 6. This same man, this same apostle, this same brother Paul says in Romans 6, Do you not understand? Now that's a, me saying it that way is, is ultimate politeness. Because the way it is actually translated means that he is telling these people to whom he is writing, how is it that you can be so blind and ignorant to your union with Christ? I mean, it, you, you read enough, you do enough research on it, you'll find that that, that is an extremely strong statement when he says, what, know ye not? Are you absolutely void of intelligence with regard to this thing? Well, that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, he's talking about the same baptism right here. In Ephesians 4, he tells us there is only one spirit and there's only one baptism and there's only one faith. One expectation of our calling. Come on, honey. One body. 
one body. Same thing here. It is a work of the Spirit of God. How could a natural mind even start to think that we can understand this, diagram it, and make a bunch of ecclesiastical type doctrines out of it? And then preach those doctrines to the division of Christians all over the world, dividing them one from another, creating denominations that are that are by definition a violation of one body. Do you see what's happened in the natural man? Well, you're going to have to lay all of that aside. For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews, Gentiles, whether bond or free, have been all made to drink into one spirit. Verse 18, now God hath set. Now God hath set. The members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now, but now, you can mark out, are they? That's been added, should be in italics in your Bible. But now, many members yet one body. Verse 27. I'm skipping through this. I intended to read the whole thing. And we probably will yet. Now, now, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ, members in particular. It's this body that I want to look at because until you understand that, everybody, you're just going to take the parts and pieces, you're going to pick out whatever part, piece that you think you are, whether you think you're the tongue or the ear or the toe or the foot or the hand or one of the fingers on the hand. Until you actually see this body. And you can only actually see this body in the face of the one man whose body it is. And when you see that, you will fall on your face, maybe and probably for the first time, and say, my Lord and my God, it's not I. And you will say that in reference to your having been thinking that you're the ear or the eye, or the nose. Or as he goes on, one of the functions of that one man that are given according to the moving of the Spirit of God. And you'll identify yourself with the function You'll do that because you don't have the slightest idea of who the man is. But when you see him as God the Father only can reveal him to be, you will fall at his feet and say, forgive me, I am not. I am not. Not I, but Christ who liveth in me. Not in some little mamby-pamby way that so many have a, a way to do. Well, now, don't look at me, folks. I mean, I'm, I'm not this, I'm not that. It's just all of Jesus. While you're going to go right on identifying it all with yourself. And then you make it worse and stand up and lie about it. 
Well, some do. Some are just blatantly open with it. It's a reason I don't even want to go into these areas because people hear what I say with a natural ear and start making application. Well, darling, I'll tell you what. Before we do any application here, if we're going to make an application, let's do it as Paul instructs us to do in every letter, even in this letter. Let's make the application at the cross. Let's make the application back with Romans. That when you were baptized into this body, you came by way of death. And I don't read anything about you or me being the resurrected man of this body. We are the body of His resurrection, all right. But He Himself is the resurrection and the life of this body. God saw this before the world was. In fact, before time was. This is an eternal reality with the Father. The other verse that I'm reading, uh, the time is gone, I see. Well, the other verse that I'm reading is uh, in Philippians, and it is Philippians 3, 21, and Lord, 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 here we go again. <laughs> so you can't take this verse just as a verse, you've got to... You really need to start with, at least here, at least with verse 1 of the chapter. But here it, here's where it all comes to. Who shall change our vile body? There's nothing here about bodies, B-O-D-I-E-S, nothing. Nothing here about bodies. A vile body. A corporate thing. There's a reason. And it's that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body. I hate to even read this verse without spending at least another 30 minutes. Because you need to know the body, the vile body is the body actually written, the body of humility. The body of humility is speaking of the body of sin or the old covenant body of Israel which relates to that. But it's not, it is not your He's not talking about the vessel in which we have this treasure any more than He is calling you as a member of the body of Christ, the body of Christ. You understand that? So when He's talking about the body here, He's not talking about somebody's dirt pot. He's not talking about bodies at all. And yet he is talking about a great change that demands what we've been talking about, demands the excellency of the greatness of his power which worketh in you. It is an enor- it, it is a change like unto which the natural eye could never see. And I think that far, far too many believers, even those who are desiring to know Him, of you 
in which we are woefully lacking. And that's the thing that's been burning in me. Fashioned here is actually speaking of a conformity. We'll have to come back to it. But here's the power whereby he is able to subdue. And you need to spend a little time looking at that. All things unto himself. No wonder Paul says that you may know the exceeding greatness of his power in us. Most believers haven't got the slightest idea, unfortunately, darling. If we've had a, a, you know, an electric shock go up our arm, we think that we have experienced the power of God. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm just telling you, no, you haven't. No, you haven't. I mean, you may have gotten... You may have, you, you know, you may have gotten all kinds of feelings. You may have gotten into all kinds of, you may have jumped, done double back flips down the aisle. Did it, did it cease? Or are you still right now, or is that what, you, you just never quit doing that? Are you still somewhere doing double back flips? I mean, has that ever ceased? If it has, it doesn't even approach the excellency of His power in us who believe. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? If it's something that has come and give you a charge and now it's gone, I don't care what you did during the meantime unless you're still doing it, that's not the power that Paul is talking about. That's not the power that brings about this very change that in my opinion everything we call the transforming of the soul it's all finally got to be gathered up here in this statement and in the understanding of what this brother is saying we've got to quit viewing the body of Christ as a bunch of people Now, Paul didn't say there weren't many members. He said, you're one body. The whole emphasis was upon that. Read it. Read it. I wanted to read it to you word by word. Get off of members. Get off of many. Get off of diversifications. You won't understand any of that until you're looking in the face of the only one whose body that's talking about. The one new man whose body we are. But not as a bunch of disconnected individuals. But that's the way most believers live, huh? In one way or another. To, to one degree or another. And that might be all right if the focus of the Father concerning that body was something other than His Son. If it was me, if it was you, then he, well, you know, yeah, all right. We're doing the best we can. But his focus is his son. His view of that body is his son. All right, I'm going to stop, but I'm urging you who are with us, and there's a whole bunch of you, 
I'm urging you, please do not just hear the words that I've had to use and then draw conclusions based upon that so that you come out looking at yourself or, or me and you or three or four or us or we as being that one man. Don't miss the man whose body you are because in him you will see a union that is beyond your imagination and yet it is not nearly as deceitful as our imagination. It doesn't imagine us as being God. You will see the truth and the truth, hon, is the thing that our soul is created for. And there's nothing like the truth. The revealing of the Son of God. I'm just asking you, don't start jumping to conclusions. Everything that we're talking about right now must be seen in the face of the one who is the end of it. May the Lord richly bless you. Once again, we're saying Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers and throughout the Lord's body. May the Lord richly bless you. If there's a way that we can be of ministry to you other than what we're doing, or in a way in which we're doing, or increase that, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Your questions, your comments, your sharings are always a blessing to us. And I want to thank once again you who help us through your faithful support to CMI, you who are helping us reach out with this gospel, not only to you, but beyond throughout the Lord's body around the world, remembering that the Lord's body is one body. May the Lord bless. Amen.